welcome uh, to another whiteboard series, um, Bowen from NIR. And today we'll have uh, with us E, co-founder of Axiom. So E, do you want to introduce a bit of yourself and also talk a bit about what Axiom is? Hey, my name is Yi. I'm one of the co-founders of Axiom. Uh, we allow smart contracts on Ethereum to access the entire history of Ethereum and do verifiable computation on top of it using zero knowledge proofs. Okay, um, cool. So I guess maybe um, just to give us, um, just to give people some background. Uh, I know, um, so for those who don't know, he is definitely one of the most prominent figures in the zero knowledge space and has been working um, like on blockchain related things like for many years. Um, like, you know, given there are so many things that zero knowledge proofs can do, like uh, why specifically do you choose to, to work on like Axiom versus like, you know, some like other things like layer twos or whatever that is? Yeah, as Bowen mentioned, one of the biggest use cases for ZK until now has been building rollups. Um, and rollups generally scale Ethereum by allowing uh, smart contract developers to build similar types of applications to those which exist on L1, but just at greater scale on L2. And so when coming up with the idea for Axiom, our North Star has always been to allow smart contracts to do new types of things that weren't possible on L1 before. Uh, not just because of scale, but because they're fundamentally a little bit different. And with Axiom, what we're doing is just building a type of system that allows smart contracts to make asynchronous calls to read more data and then do compute on that data. Um, so to start, we're offering access, as I mentioned, to the history of Ethereum, and then we're allowing developers to do compute on that history. So yep. maybe I can draw a little yeah, diagram yeah, please, of, please of the do, flow. Please do. So in general, we have sort of the, the Axiom contract. And later on, we'll expand to this to the you know, real architecture. So for now, cartoon. Yep. Um, and so a developer will you know, make a query. And this query will uh, require some access to some historic data. So imagine a receipt or a transaction. And then it will also access some computation over that data. You might imagine adding up a user's uh, trading volume. Yep. Yep. And so what Axiom is going to do is generate a ZK proof that you know, whatever claimed data value or computation actually authentically be belonged to the history of Ethereum. And after this proof is generated, it's going to send this proof to the, a verifier on chain. And once that zero knowledge proof is verified, uh, we actually send a callback to the developer's contract. And so in, in this way, uh, we allow developers to actually access sorts of data that weren't possible to access before within the EVM. Yeah, so I think one obvious question people would have is probably regarding this part, right? So uh, I think the, the natural question people want to ask is, well, why couldn't we just do it like as is today? Like where, where does they can help? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think unless you've tried to develop a smart contract before, you probably wouldn't know that uh, within the EVM and actually within most uh, smart contract development languages, you can't access any type of historic information. So that means the previous owner of an NFT or any type of transaction history um, just isn't present in the state of Ethereum or any other blockchain. And there's actually a fundamental reason for that, which is that Suppose we just changed Ethereum so you could access any historic state. That would mean that every validating node on Ethereum would need to be able to access historic state extremely quickly in order to validate a transaction. And so that would mean that they would have to turn every full node into an archive node, which definitely hurts the decentralization of Ethereum. So there's sort of a fundamental trade-off between increasing the set of data that uh, contracts can access and decentralization. So, as someone asks, like, how, do we, how does ZK help this situation? Well, the answer is that uh, when you 
currently run a uh, transaction on Ethereum, we're relying on the Ethereum consensus to, um, to validate your data access in your compute. Uh, instead, we're replacing that consensus here with ZK. So ZK uses cryptography uh, instead to do, that, to do that. So let me explain like, how that works. So first of all, you know, why is that even possible? We're gonna use actually the simplest possible property of a blockchain. Okay, so a blockchain is a chain of blocks, and what that means is that the current block, well, it contains a commitment to the previous block, the block before, and actually the entire history of the blockchain. And so what that means is suppose we wanted to access a piece of data from this historic block. Well, in principle, this historic block is actually committed to in the current block. So we could supply a decommitment proof of this chain of block headers from a past block to the current block. And so what would that decommitment proof look like? It would simply say that, hey, I know a sequence of block headers, let's say this intermediate one and this intermediate one, such that the hash of this block is contained in the header of this block, mm -hmm. the hash of this header is contained in the header of this one, and so on. So if I could exhibit that to you, then you would know that this historic block was authentically present in the history of this chain. Um, now, that, that, in principle, allows you to know the entire block history of Ethereum. And within the historic block, well, we actually have a commitment to the entire state of Ethereum at that block. So that takes the form of the state root, uh, the transactions root, and the receipts root. So the state root commits to all accounts and account storage. Uh, the transaction root, of course, commits to the transactions in this block. And the receipts root commits to the receipts or log events in this block. So again, we could just decommit. And maybe we would get a receipt here. So if, yeah, so I think one issue or well, one problem here is that um, uh, if the decommit chain is very, very long, if you're trying to prove something that's like, like one million blocks ago, um, this structure by itself may become some problem. And my understanding is that Ethereum like blockchain by itself doesn't have the mountain, like Merkle mountain thing that built in. So like need to like build some structure itself, I guess. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you think about actually performing these decommitments in the EVM, you're gonna run into sort of two classes of challenges. So the first is that this, so challenge one is the chain could be huge. So if you just want to put the block headers on Ethereum, that's gonna be way too much data and your costs will explode. Uh, the second challenge is that the, uh, let's call this decommitment number two. Uh, the decommitment number two for actually proving data from each block uh, requires something called a merkle patricia tri proof. So this is a Merkle proof into this degree 16 Merkle tree that Ethereum uses to commit to all data. And the other problem, the problem with that is that it's also huge. And so if you actually want to do this on Ethereum, uh, just in the raw EVM, your cost is gonna be exorbitant. Um, so we have sort of two techniques at Axiom to resolve uh, these two problems. So the first uh, pertains to this first step of decommitting the chain of block headers. So what we do there is that as Bowen mentioned, sometimes this chain could be like quite long. So let's say that this is not four blocks in the past, but let's pretend that this is 
one million blocks. Well, in this case, you have to exhibit one million block headers, which is not great. So what we do instead is we actually maintain a cache on Ethereum to, that commits to the entire history of Ethereum block hashes. So we call this Axiom Core. And this is a cache of all Ethereum block hashes. Now, when I say cache, I don't mean that we literally store them all, since obviously accessing them is pretty costly. Instead, what I mean is we have a commitment to all block hashes, and we want that commitment to actually satisfy two properties. Uh, the first is that um, we want updates to be cheap. Uh, namely, you know, more block hashes are post-pended, and we need to update the cache. Uh, the second is that we want the uh, commitment of effectively O of one size. Um, I say effectively because in reality this is going to be log n size, yep. but n yeah, log n doesn't yeah, grow that fast yeah. for, mm -hmm. for a blockchain. And so what we use is something called a Merkle mountain range. And we actually use a small twist on a Merkle mountain range, which I'll explain in a little bit. Yeah, so maybe let's actually yeah. dive into Yeah, let's this. dive into yeah. what because a this is, is. I, I don't think this is a very well-known uh, data structure that people use. And actually, even though we have this built into near, um, I think that was like at least three years ago. <laughs> At the time, I, I didn't know this is a thing, like there's like a name to this. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember talking to Ilya about this yeah, two yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so to explain like what a Merkle mountain range is, maybe I'll draw a picture of all block caches on Ethereum, starting from Genesis. So we have, so this is block number. So we have block zero to, I think we're on like 17 million now, maybe 18 million. Yeah. Let's just say 17 million. So a Merkle mountain range is a structure which allows you to commit to um, any number of hashes um, while taking only log n commitment size. And it has these two properties, like properties that updates are relatively cheap, uh, the commitment is relatively small, and you can actually decommit any uh, block hash in this interval in a cheap way. So here's how it works. Um, it's basically just a sequence of Merkle trees, hence a Merkle mountain range. So first, you're going to fit the largest binary Merkle tree you can into this range. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we take the leaves from 0 to, oh, I should, OK, it's, <laughs> let's imagine this is roughly 16 million. That's going to be the value. <laughs> My diagram yeah, is going to yeah. be not so good. Yeah. And then, so first, we chose the largest Merkle tree we can fit into this range. And we take the Merkle root. So this will be peak zero of the Merkle mountain range. Then we repeat. We take another Merkle tree that's as big as possible. And this will be peak one. And we just keep going. Mm -hmm. And so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a Merkle mountain range is just a sequence of peaks uh, of Merkle roots, of Merkle trees, yep. of descending size. Um, now, what's the benefit of this? Well, as you can see, the whole commitment is of size log n. In particular, it's the number of ones in the binary representation of the total number of blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is as we append blocks here, you can sort of see intuitively that you're only going to modify those peaks which change. Mm -hmm. And that size is pretty small. Um, so it has these two properties. And so if we want to prove that some block hash was in the history of Ethereum, all we need to do is give a standard Merkle proof into one of the peaks. Mm -hmm. And that would show sort of that it was committed to in this Merkle mountain range. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about a slight tweak we make mm -hmm. to address uh, this update issue. Yep. So what we actually store is not quite a Merkle mountain range. 
we actually store a Merkle mountain range. of Merkle roots of uh, 124 block hash chunks. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and in addition to this, we always store the trailing 124 um, Sorry, how to say. The, we, st we store the Merkle root of a zero padded Merkle sure. tree mm -hmm. of size 1024 holding the last few leaves, uh, last few hashes. And what does the last few hashes mean? Yeah, so, so this will store from 0 to 124 times k, or some k. Okay. And this will store from 1024 times k okay. to 1024 times k plus m. Oh, I see, I see. m is the trailing segment. I see, I see, I see. So what we do is that we will keep this Merkle root updated mm -hmm. until such time as we need to update it, the mm -hmm. full Merkle mountain range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, and makes sense. Yeah, so the reason for this is that in Ethereum, it's relatively expensive to update storage. Mm. Yep. So if you think about blocks being appended, these last 10 peaks of the Merkle mountain range mm -hmm. to account for up to 1024, they get updated quite a bit. Mm. So instead of actually updating them, we, right, it's right. much simpler for us to just update this Merkle root. I see, I see, I see. And then once you get to the next one, you merge it back into the... Yeah, exactly. So once we get to the next one, we merge it back into this yeah. Merkle mountain range. Yeah. So we call this a padded Merkle mountain range, but okay. It's, okay. this is sort of a non-standard data structure. So right, we have right. a Merkle mountain range for almost all of it, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. we have this uh, zero padded Merkle root at the end. How, how much does this save you in practice? It, it, it's quite a bit. Oh, so, okay. so, um, Basically, if suppose you do an update for, let's say, 200 uh, block caches, mm -hmm. then an expectation you're going to update, uh, you know, eight of the peaks of yep. the Mer mm -hmm. Merkle mountain. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, eight S stores. Mm. With, they're they're warm, but okay, that that's quite a bit. I see. I see. I see. Okay. Um, okay. So I so far we've just talked about the, the data structure we're using. Right. Right. And yeah. These updates, you know, in principle, could be done in EVM. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, in practice, doing the updates in EVM has sort of two challenges. So, as we see, we have this chain of blocks. And let's indicate here which blocks are actually already committed to in our Merkle mountain range. So, let's say that this is in the so Merkle Mountain Range is abbreviated MMR. Mm -hmm. So suppose we're in the Merkle Mountain Range, and now some new blocks have occurred, mm -hmm. and we want to update. Mm -hmm. So the, the fact we can use is that in Ethereum, you actually have access to the last 256 mm. blocks. Uh, block hashes. It's a bit of a mystery to me why it's 256. Uh, I think there's no actual issues mm -hmm. if you make it all block caches, to be honest. Mm. But you know, we have to work with what we have, so yep. we're currently at 256. Um, and so what we do is we, we use the fact that we have a single recent one Okay, so now you might imagine that in EVM, you can just access the last 256, do some Merkle roots computations mm -hmm. in EVM, mm -hmm. and start appending to this data structure. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge with that is that suppose you just don't manage to do the update mm -hmm. in a 256 block window. So that's sort of mm -hmm. 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, now you're kind of in trouble yep. because how yep. do you connect back to your yep. Merkle route? Mm -hmm. um, so th it's not a very robust system. Right. Uh, so instead, what we do is we just choose this recent one, 
And we generate a zero knowledge proof mm. of the chain of block hashes back to the last multiple of 1024. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I see. I see. So, so let's, it's not so clear how to denote that, but let's say it's like this. So we do this in ZK. I see. I see. Um, so what that means is that in the typical happy path, uh, if we're within this 256 block hash window, mm -hmm. we check that this chain of block headers connects to each other, mm -hmm. uh, that the last block hash is in this 256 block window, mm -hmm. uh, and then we check that this like, starting point actually aligns with the endpoint of our Merkle memory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now, suppose that we missed some. Yep. Then what we can do is we first prove this chunk yep. of mm -hmm. up to 1024, mm -hmm. and we can sort of backfill with chunks of 1024. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So no, no matter what happens, we can always get back to this uh, right, right. where we were in the Merkle mm -hmm, memory. Mm -hmm. And in practice, how often do you do this update? So in practice, we do it every 192 blocks. 192 blocks. And we, we could probably get a little bit more aggressive. Okay, but okay. There's and then how long does it take to generate the, the zero knowledge proof? Oh, it's, it's pretty fast. Like, okay, I, okay. I think two minutes or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, okay. And, and we're, that, that's with some cost saving. So, so see, if you I really see. wanted to, you could do lower. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I see. Yeah, we, we run on like not a great machine. <laughs> I, see, I see, I see, I see. So, so our philosophy is we always want to maintain the property mm -hmm. that this commitment with the Merkle mountain range mm -hmm. always overlaps the 256 block caches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that way the cache will always commit, the cache plus the EVM block hash opcode always commits mm -hmm. to the entire history of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, that makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, yes, there's maybe one more thing which we didn't discuss, which is when we deploy the contract, Mm -hmm. There's nothing in it. Ah, right, so right. what do we do then? We have to build this like yep. from scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so okay, so we, we actually have a separate uh, way of bootstrapping, mm -hmm. um, which proves the block hashes in chunks of 128,000. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, we start. We can. Yeah, maybe we erase. Erase some parts, like. Yeah, I'll erase. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so suppose we start, you know, again at 17 million. Mm -hmm. We're going to prove, you know, this is 128 times 1024. Then we prove 128 times 1024, and we just keep going back. Mm -hmm. And okay, there's some complications surrounding that 17 million is not a multiple yeah, yeah. of mm -hmm. 1024, but mm -hmm. we, we just handle this, and we eventually get here. Mm -hmm. So, so now we have sort of in groups of 128 times 1024, we actually write the groups, uh, every Merkle root of 1024. Mm, and okay. then we construct the Merkle mountain range in EVM, actually. I see. But that is quite expensive to do, right? That, that construction. It's like, OK. OK. <laughs> like, it, it's, it's definitely a little bit expensive. I think it costs like 20K total. OK. But okay. It, it just simplifies the system so that we don't have to think about, like, right, some parts okay. of the system have chunks of. 128,000 ah, other parts right, of chunks right. of 1024. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we could definitely probably cost optimize by dropping some of these. Ah, I see. Uh, I see. But it, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah sense. the cost is not crazy, so we, we kind of just do it. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, we have to do, I think it's something like 130 of these. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then once we have bootstrapped the system to this state, mm -hmm. all we need to do is maintain it in this way. Right, right, right. So basically in this entire part of this uh, chain proof, the only part where you use the K is like this part like of maintaining uh, the Merkle mountain range uh, in light of the more recent blocks. Yeah, uh, both the recent blocks and uh, this historic bootstrapping. Ah, okay, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we, we obey the principle that a user of our system shouldn't need to trust us really in any way. Ah, like if yeah. something has been posted, it really has been verified mm -hmm. either in EVM or by ZK. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, makes sense. Um, okay, so should we move on to the other part of the proof? The, yeah. The, yeah. Cool. So, so so far we have this cache and we sort of maintain it to have this property. Um, Let's redraw it. Now, the, the next step is that we actually need to access 
the history of Ethereum from this cache. So let's say we're in this situation. And let's say that the MMR committed to this much so far. Mm -hmm. And this is Axiom Core. And so this is just a vanilla smart contract mm -hmm. on Ethereum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now we want to actually ask, like, hey, I want a transaction from, uh, from this block. I want a storage value from this block, mm -hmm. and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the way that we allow users to express this is in something we call a query. Mm -hmm. So what, what's a query? Well, OK, it's a couple things. It's a list of data that the, the user wants. And so we allow pretty arbitrary data. So we format the data as just 32-byte chunks from the history of Ethereum. And they can come from uh, block headers, uh, accounts, storage, mm -hmm. transactions, receipts. Mm -hmm. And we're also handling uh, solidity mappings. Oh, OK. So it's a subset of storage, of course. Yep. Mm -hmm. But as you probably know, like the mapping of solidity key value pair mm -hmm. to storage slot is a bit complex. Mm -hmm. And it's actually better to handle the decay. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. And so our, our principle is that anything in the history of Ethereum is parameterized in this way. And OK, we have some pretty long, complicated list of how it's parameterized. And so the user can specify um, basically these 32 bytes at a time. So for example, if you want to read transaction call data, mm -hmm. we let you just specify, hey, I want you know, this index to this index mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in multiples of 32. Um, similarly, for receipts, you can access, uh, you know, I want the first log, I see. and I want this data field in that log, and so on. And, and what's the reason why it has to be 32 bytes at a time? Um, so, so we let you do multiple queries. Right. So this right. is just a way to make your query like more sensitive. Okay. okay. So you can print, you can definitely write some sort of wrapper language around it. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. like concatenates these queries. Right, right, right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So there's this data side of the query, mm -hmm. and then we also allow users to specify. Uh, compute. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we, we talked with a lot of users about what type of compute they want, and we decided that the answer is that they kind of just want arbitrary compute. <laughs> so, so we created the system that you can actually plug in your own ZK circuit mm -hmm. to specify the computation you want right. over this data. Mm -hmm. So you can. And so I think one thing that's maybe not so obvious is that if you want to use on-chain data for your application, even if you don't think you're using compute, you probably are yep. using some small amount of compute. Yep. Yep. Um, so just to give an example, suppose you want to find a user's average Ethereum balance mm -hmm. over the last, yep. like over five blocks at some interval. Mm -hmm. Then what you'd want to find, uh, let me. Let's say here. So, okay. Yep. So suppose we want to take the average uh, with a 10 block gap and with over five blocks. Mm -hmm. So what you would fetch in the data query is sort of you know, the balance of the address at block the balance of the address at block plus 10, mm -hmm. and so on. And so, so you might ask, like, what's the computation? OK, of course, we have to average these numbers. Yep. Uh, but what you also have to do is constrain that the block that you're putting mm -hmm. in here really differs by 10. Right, right. And there's all sorts of these sort of bookkeeping constraints. Yep, yep. And so we allow users just to specify this in, in an arbitrary way yep. in the computation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I guess from like user point of view, they're not really writing a circuit directly, right? If, if, because if they do, then probably that not that many people would actually do it. Yeah, so we created a, uh, a JavaScript front end mm -hmm. for users to 
they are writing a circuit, right. but for this sort of circuit, it's, it's not quite what you think of as yeah. writing a circuit. You're literally just constraining some equalities. Right, right, right. I see. Um, but if, I imagine if they actually want to do like a lot more complex computation, then um, it might actually get more involved. Um, I don't know what's a good example. Like they want to compute some complex function over like a, some like data and uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Like we think that the computations are going to split into two categories. Mm -hmm. One is just sort of this bookkeeping stuff. Right, right. And we mm -hmm. think that a user can write that yep. with yeah, no yeah, issue. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, but of course, if you want to write, let's say, a machine learning model yep. or something yeah, yeah, complicated, yeah, yeah. Yep. then yeah, you need to use something different. You, you, you need to plug in something not written in this sort of framework. Right, right. And then do you have like a separate framework for that or like what's the plan for, for that? Yes. Yeah, so the plan is, and I'll explain maybe. Yeah, yeah. So, the plan for that comes in when we connect these two, mm -hmm. right? So, so far we let, let's just assume that we can, you know, prove the data yep. and we can prove the computation. Mm -hmm. So the way our system works is that within the computation, um, okay, let me. I'll erase this. Yeah, yeah erase that yeah. part. Yeah. So, so the idea is that. Here's the computation, and this is actually on the lap on a user's laptop. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So we have sort of the computation, which is pretty trivial. Like we have block, right. block, mm -hmm. block plus ten, and so on. Right. And then we have a bunch of sort of requests. Right. So in this request, you would ask for, hey, here's give me the balance. Here's a request for the balance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. yep. Then what the user does is actually send a proof of this, mm -hmm. which carries these requests right. to our um, Axiom query contract. Mm -hmm. So we index this contract, and we glue this together with the fulfillment of those requests mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with data proofs. Mm -hmm. So we take, so in here, we do compute. Plus data. Mm -hmm. So what I what I mean by that is that the user's saying making some claims about the history of Ethereum, mm -hmm. like hey my balance at this block was whatever was one, my balance at ten blocks later was ten, mm -hmm. and so on. So these are just assertions in this compute proof, and what we do is we provide zk proofs for those assertions in this data part, mm -hmm. and then we also check that the assertions we provided. Yep. are compatible with the request. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we wrap all of those together into a single proof. Mm -hmm. And we feed back that back here. Right. And, and OK, so, so how does that answer your question about the more complicated computations? Yep. Our vision is that the user can just start adding uh, more requests. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing about the request that is specific to the fact that it's you know, data. Right. It right. could be, let's say, oh, ECG I see, I see, say. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or what, anything complex. Right. And so in general, we think that there should be this division between what's happening on the client side and the server side. Right, right. Or, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and really, it's more like what's happening on the user interface side versus like the, uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the ZK like, sure. backend side. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually here, like why does this part need to happen on the, on the user side? Like what's the, I mean, because all, like all the data is public, right? There's no like Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, it's actually just a uh, like free option. Okay. So okay. we let you, we have a flexible system. You can right. do it on the user side. Right. Uh, the reason that's really helpful for developers is they don't have to set up any mm. proving infrastructure. Right. Right. They kind of they can put it. We we developed a uh, WebAssembly prover, mm. okay. and so yeah, your user can just run it yep. in their web app, and okay, it's a pretty small proof, yep. and everything else that's heavy is delegated to our system. Right. Right. But I, I imagine at some point, um, well, may, maybe like um, maybe think about it in another way. Maybe um, if the if what user wants to do is something that's uh, more heavy, then I imagine most of the things would actually be delegated to the server, right? Yeah, in that case, right. what are they actually doing on the kind of the user interface side? Yeah, so I think there is there are two possibilities here. Mm -hmm. uh, one option is that on the user interface side, mm -hmm. it's really just glue code. Yeah, 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 makes sense. Yeah, so it's it's just things like 
oh, I wanted my balance. Mm -hmm. Let's say I want 100 balances, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I feed it into machine learning model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then on the user side, it would just be, hey, my balance at block, at whatever block, at 10 blocks later and so on. Right. right. And then also that, hey, the outputs from these balances really are the inputs mm -hmm, to this machine mm -hmm. learning model that mm -hmm, I'm verifying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, yep, makes sense. Uh, and coming back to this, uh, the more heavy lifting part, uh, because you, eventually you need to generate a proof that's, uh, that needs to be verified in a SIM contract, I imagine you have to do some kind of uh, proof compression or something, and also there's some like limitation to like how, how, like, um, how much um, compute you can prove in, in, in like single proof. And so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's talk about this part, yep. where I guess all the substantial stuff is happening. Yep. So there's two pieces of this. One is, you know, how are these data proofs generated? Mm -hmm. And the second is, you know, how is this compatibility between the compute proof and the data yep. proof happening? Mm -hmm. um, given what we have here, maybe we start with the second. Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay, so as primitives here, I'm gonna assume that we have a compute proof. And so this could be either from a laptop or server. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't really care where it comes from. If it's small, as we discussed, it yep. could come from a laptop. Mm -hmm. If it's big, it should come from a server. Yep, yep. Um, now we have, and I just call it a data proof, but it could include things like ECDSA. Oh, the ECDSA would actually come from here. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so, okay, okay, so, okay. So you could imagine like, so here we just currently were, Currently on testnet, we're supporting like any piece of Ethereum data, uh -huh. but to, we also have circuits for, you know, you can imagine ECDSA here. Okay. And our system is flexible enough that you can yeah, just yeah, yeah. modular mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we need to do? We need to check that the data proof actually proved everything that was requested by the compute proof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we do this operation called proof aggregation. And what that does is kind of exactly what I said. Yep. So it creates a combined proof, so an aggregate proof. Um, that, so it does like a couple things. The first is that the, uh, the compute proof is valid. Mm -hmm. And right. one thing that we, one special thing we offer is that the compute proof carries its own verification key. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we do an operation here, the aggregation, it's actually universal. Uh, I see. So what that means is that what we're checking is not that the compute proof is valid against a fixed verification key, mm, but I against see, the I verification see, okay. key that the user actually provides. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The second statement we're checking is that the data proof is compatible with the compute proof, as we just discussed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How is that checked exactly? When is like you are you actually need to check some um, like assertion of, of like the data, right? Like how how is this part checked? Yes, yes. I, <laughs> yeah, we we I, I will get to that. But okay. Basically, the maybe the last thing to say is like yeah, the data proof is valid, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when I say the data proof is valid, well, you can't prove in isolation, as you're alluding to, mm -hmm. that some piece of data occurs in the history yep. of Ethereum. You need some like root of trust. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so what's our root of trust? It's going to actually be a Merkle Mountain range. Mm. It's a claimed Merkle Mountain range. I see. And when I say claimed Merkle Mountain range, it's just a string of hashes yep. that we claim are a valid Merkle mm -hmm. Mountain range mm -hmm. in the history of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And this we are going to need to verify on chain. Mm, I see. So we need to reconcile this claim mm -hmm. against the uh, data structure that we had before, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, against this, uh, this cache of block hashes in Axiom Core. Mm -hmm. um, I see. Yeah, so, so I want to talk about a, a couple subtleties yep. relating to this universal aggregation. Uh, the first is that, you know, why do we do this at all? Mm -hmm. 
And the main motivation is that we don't have to change our on-chain verifier, mm -hmm. even if the compute circuit is just completely swapped out. Mm -hmm. So and all of these components, because they carry their V keys with them, yep. and we actually have in an output, um, okay, we, we call it an aggregate V key hash. What they say? So okay, what is that? That is a <laughs> commitment to all of the V keys uh -huh. and the aggregation structure. I see. So if you know the aggregate V key hash, mm -hmm. you know exactly what was proven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. E even if the compute proof structure is totally different, mm -hmm. or if these components were different, mm -hmm. um, once if the user knows the aggregate V key hash, mm -hmm. then it knows what the proof was about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we verify on chain, we always give you, hey, this proof was valid. Here's what it claimed, and here is like the hash of all the V keys and the structure that entered it. Right. So the user can know from this like whether this query result actually corresponds to like something they're interested in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 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 this aggregates all the V keys from like all the from all of these. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. And so what that means is that a user can use our system to do a compute proof mm -hmm. that we don't have to know about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The user just sends us their V key, sends us their proof, yep. and to us, it's all kind of the same. Yep, 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 makes sense. Um, so the, the second thing I want to mention is that they don't have to deploy a verifier. Mm -hmm. Like so, so here we have like a verifier, and it's universal. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So so that means that if you're a smart contract developer and you want to use the system. Mm -hmm. You, all you need to do is to validate this aggregate VK hash mm -hmm. coming from our system, and there's no like ZK specific contract deployments. Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 makes sense. Um, okay, should we come back to some of the points here? Like how exactly? Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so, so far we've talked about, here we have the compute proof and the data proof. We do this universal aggregation procedure yep. that gives a commitment to what was aggregated, yep. checks the validity of the compute proof and the data proof. Mm -hmm. And those validities are, the, the trust is rooted in a claim from Merkle Mountain Range. Yep. Um, and in the validity of the compute proof obviously depends on the yep. key. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now there's uh, maybe two points left. The first is, what does it mean that the compute and data proofs are compatible? Yep. Um, that's actually easy. Just the compute proof makes some requests, and we check in ZK that those requests correspond to what the data proof was proved. Okay. So, so the data proof would say like, hey, here's the balance of account ABC. We just check that that is actually the same as what was requested in the compute proof. I see, but, but from like a ZK point of view, how exactly does it work? Because those are two separate proofs, right? Yes, yes. So from ZK point of view, we have sort of a public instance mm -hmm. and a public instance. Okay. So what the aggregation proof is doing is, in the proofs, they mm -hmm. don't say anything. Yeah, you yeah, just verify mm -hmm. them. Yep. But now in the instances, you're actually allowed to manipulate them within oh. the aggregation procedure. I see, I see. So, so these public instances are private inputs to the aggregation circuit. Ah. And that circuit will just constrain oh, certain equalities between them. I see, I see, I see. OK, OK, OK. So it's, it, so this aggregation, oh, I see, so those are the, input to this, I see. So each, each aggregation proof has this different uh, private, uh, private inputs, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, so the compute proof, as well as these instances, are inputs to the aggregation proof. Right, right. I see, I see. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Um, OK, so the details of how to do it are a little bit complicated because there's quite a bit of bookkeeping. Yeah. But at the fundamental level, we're just checking that certain requests here actually correspond to the answers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so, so maybe the last missing piece of all this is how does like the data proof really work? Yep. Right. This is sort of yep. big black box right now. Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna redraw the <laughs> diagram. So remember, we have this Axiom core contract. We have this MMR. And now, 
for the data proofs, they aggregate sort of a number of what we call subqueries. So a subquery is just a request for a single piece of data in the history. Mm -hmm. So let me talk about how to just do a single subquery. Mm -hmm. So let's imagine we're trying to prove a storage value. So we call this a storage subquery. Yep. And what does that have to prove? It has to prove that the value of slot, or, so maybe, let me say how to parameterize it. Yep. When we talk about a value, a piece of Ethereum storage, we care about the block number, mm -hmm. the address we're talking about, and then for each address, the local contract storage is mm -hmm. a key value pair. Mm -hmm. So it's a key value pair um, from uint256 to uint256. Mm -hmm. And this is called a slot. Mm -hmm. So we care about the slot. Yep. And the output is the slot value. Right. Okay, so how do we prove this? So the data structure in Ethereum is that we have a block header. Within the block header, we have a state root. Mm -hmm. And the state root is a commitment to a Merkle Patricia try, which holds uh, all information about accounts. So I will attempt to depict this. <laughs> So this thing is the account try. Mm -hmm. So let's imagine that this address really corresponds to this account. Mm -hmm. Now, this account will have the not balance storage root and then code hash. Mm -hmm. so, don't worry about the others, but what's important is that the contract storage is committed to in the storage root. Mm -hmm. And the storage root is, again, a root of a degree 16 Merkle Patricia try. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere, let's say here, is the um, key value, is the, is the value that we're looking for. So this is the uh, storage try. And here, we will get the value. Mm -hmm. So what is the statement we're actually proving? We're proving that we have a block header that's indexed by block number. Mm -hmm. That's this one. Then we are looking up the, we're looking up an account by the address in the account try. Then for the storage root from that account try, yep. we're looking up a slot. Yep. And so the slot is the key in the storage try, and we end up with the value. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, okay, so that's a pretty complicated procedure. Yep. And what do we actually have to do? So the first thing is that we look up the block header in this MMR. Mm -hmm. And so I'm describing operations we're doing just as pure computations, yep. but in, in reality, we're going to do all these computations in ZK. Okay, yep. Now, the second is we have to do lookups into these account and storage tries. Mm -hmm. Uh, so these will be pretty parallel, and yep. so I'll describe them just kind of separately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so how does that work? We have a root. We have a degree 16 mm -hmm. try. And then we have a leaf that we're interested in. Yep. So in, the, in a degree 16 Merkle tree try, what we have to prove, or how to exhibit that this leaf actually is yep. committed to in the root. What we have to do is just display all nodes that it visited on the path up to the root. Mm -hmm. So that corresponds to commitments, yep. or to, to the data of each of these yep. nodes. Yep. <laughs> and so there's basically two steps to this. The first is, because it's a Merkle tree, we care about the serialization of the nodes. Mm -hmm. And so Ethereum uses what's called RLP, RLP. serialization. Yep. 
And RLP is recursive length prefix. So this is some type of serialization that is self-describing. So the first few bytes uh, yeah. tell you about the length of the whole structure. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's used to serialize each node. And we have to, in ZK, deserialize. It's a little bit complicated because yep. of the dynamic length properties. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so the next step is we have to do the hash checks with uh, ketchak. Yep. So the hash function in Ethereum is ketchak. So we need to check that the hash of this node really appears in this node at this proper location. Mm -hmm. And this is actually okay. the most, um, most expensive operation. Yep. Just because Ketchak is the most expensive operation in ZK. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, actually, this whole thing, like, I mean, this whole thing, uh, obviously, people do in, in like different blockchains and pretty well known that. But I think the problem in ZK is that it's actually quite expensive because you're, you're doing a lot of, potentially, a lot of Ketchak, like, both in the MMR, also in like the different tries. Um, so, like, how expensive um, is it to actually generate the proof in, in practice? Yeah, it's, um, we, okay, so, it's actually kind of a complicated question to answer. Yeah. So I'll describe some of the optimizations. Yeah. I think the best way to answer is two components. One is how many catch acts can you do yep. per second? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then how can you use those catch acts optimally? Yep. So we can do, I think it's around 30 catch acts per second right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how, given that, how do we actually do these? Yep. So one complicated issue is that this is a, a dynamic depth. Mm -hmm. And these are dynamic size. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do is actually, because Ketchak actually takes something like 90% of the proof yep. time, mm -hmm. we create a Ketchak table. Oh, okay. So okay. we have just a separate set of circuits that do just Ketchak. Mm -hmm. And their job is just to produce as outputs, like Ketchak input-output pairs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so remember I, I had this picture of we had like the... Uh, we have the compute proof. We have the data proof. Mm -hmm. And the reality is we actually have a third proof, which is the catch act proof. I see. I see. And in the aggregation, we reconcile the compute proof with the data proof. I see. And for each data proof, we reconcile with the catch up proof. I so the see, data I proofs see. just do the sort of parsing logic I see, and I make see. requests for catch up input output pairs. I see. And they reconcile against this catch up proof. I see, I see. Okay, okay. So basically, like each time you need to do a catch up proof, you like kind of delegate that to the, the other circuit. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I and see. that also helps us with the dynamic depth. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about, let's say this was depth four. Mm -hmm. But maybe we need it up to depth, depth 10 in some mm -hmm, cases. Mm -hmm. So what we would have here is sort of dummy values. Right, right. And so crucially, when we have a repeated catch act request, mm -hmm. we only use one row of this table. Ah, uh, I, I see. And so what that means is that we can have a pretty I large see. max see. depth yep. without really imposing more catch act costs. I see, I see. OK, yeah, that's quite interesting. And then and in practice, how? expensive, like in, maybe in terms of time or like cost is it to, to actually do this thing? Yeah, yeah, so in, okay, so, so there's sort of two considerations for us. Yeah. One is parallel latency, mm -hmm. and the other is just total latency mm -hmm. and or cost. Mm -hmm. um, so for, in practice, we have a configuration with up to 32 of any type of query. Okay. So we had the block header queries, account yep. queries, uh -huh. storage queries, and so on. And that takes six minutes to run end okay. to end. So that includes all the proofs, all the aggregation mm -hmm. to a form that can be verified on chain. That's pretty fast. Okay. Yeah. And actually, one thing that we <coughs> learned that is not so obvious is that there's quite a bit of trade off between flexibility and performance. I see. So, so here, like, we're allowing you to query any block in the history of Ethereum in a totally heterogeneous way. So you can have a transaction from this block, an account from this block, and we have to pay for that a bit in the ZK side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think if we like reduce some of the flexibility, we could probably get that number down maybe by half, maybe more. I see. I see. 
Cool. Um, given that we're kind of about to run out of time, um, and we also kind of uh, already dive deep into the two parts of the, the proof, uh, is there anything else you want to talk about uh, regarding Axiom? Yeah, one thing I want to say about is, well, we're going to launch this on testnet. I think probably we'll be already live by the time this video comes out. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I want to mention is that we're going to bring Axiom to layer twos as well. Oh, that's cool. And actually, one thing, we were a little bit worried about how complex that would be, but it's actually pretty simple. Hmm. So this is all about layer one. Yep. And so the first step is we're going to verify layer one on layer two. Uh, I see, I see. And so our design is that we're not going to change the ZK proof at all. Mm. Instead, what we're going to do is to take this Axiom core structure and basically port it to you know, Optimism, Arbitrum, Scroll, mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, then you can verify all of these proofs <coughs> just on our contracts on each of these. I see. I see, I see. <clears throat> so they're, they're basically just like a regular smart contract in each of those um, layer twos. Yeah, just a regular smart contract. Yeah. Um, it depends a bit on the bridge structure. Mm. So for, let's say, Arbitrum or Scroll or ZK Sync, yep. the bridge structure is uh, via message passing from L1. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we have to do is just message pass a commitment to our MMR. I see. And we just verify uh, I against that. I see, I see. Uh, for Optimism, we can also do that. And there's some chance we can optimize a little bit because on OP stack, you can access L1 just natively. Uh, uh, right, right, right. Yep, yep. That, that is very cool. Um, I'm excited to see that, that launch. <laughs> yep. uh, yeah, other than that, I think we covered most things. Went pretty deep, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, I think then it's time to wrap up. And again, thanks, E, for joining me on another uh, episode of the Whiteboard session. And yep, thanks, everyone.